Welcome to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. My name is Carl Stitchen, and I'm the director of IELTS. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to the director series of uh, se seminars, uh, which is a monthly remote event on the Institute calendar. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome, and it is a great pleasure to welcome today, remotely to the Institute, Professor Chris Waters. Chris is a member of the Faculty of Law at the University of Windsor in Canada. He was Dean of the Faculty from 2015 until earlier this year. His research interests are in the areas of public international law, international humanitarian law, law and politics in Eastern Europe, and active transportation and the law. He has extensive human rights and election monitoring field experience in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. He's currently the co-editor of the Canadian Bar Review with Professor David Tanovich, and he's on the editorial board of the Journal on the Use of Force and International Law. Chris's paper today is entitled The Role of Border Cities in International Law, which is uh, certainly appropriate given where he's based. He's going to speak for about 40 minutes and questions can be raised by our audience members in the Q&A function at any time. I will then attempt to moderate the questions in the discussion period. The seminar is scheduled for about 90 minutes. Closed captioning should be available at the bottom of your screen if you need it. So without further ado, it's over to Chris. Welcome remotely to the Institute. Thanks so much, Carl. Uh, Professor Stitchin, it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, no existential kind of reference meant by that. It's, it's a delight to, to receive your invitation and to, to see you again. Now, Carl didn't mention the most important part of my biography, which is that he hired me at the University of Reading School of Law many, many years ago uh, now. And it's, it's a pleasure to see you, Carl. And thank you behind the scenes to uh, Dali and IELTS as well. So I will start sharing my screen. Good to go. Okay. Well, and, and thanks very much to uh, everyone out there for, for joining me. As Carl mentioned, I, I am in a border city. In fact, I can look out my window and, and see Detroit from where I live. As a child who grew up in the 70s and 80s in, in Canada, um, you know, in the true era of, 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 of sort of a rising Canadian confidence in itself, being in, in a border city was at first very strange, disconcerting. And I, I think, in fact, many people in border cities have a sort of transnational ennui sometimes, uh, anxiety, there's a certain ambiguity or unsettled aspect of being in border city. Uh, and I found it very strange when I first moved here to be so close uh, to the United States. Um, but I I've, I've really em embraced uh, Windsor as a city and as a border city in particular, uh, and it's sometimes referred to as South Detroit because while most of Canada is north of the United States and Windsor here, we're actually south of the United States just as the Great Lakes dip around. And, and, and Detroit in particular, less so the United States as a whole, but Detroit in particular, which is a really unique city, has very much become part of, uh, of, of, a, of our daily life, of our daily practice, even at work as we have uh, partnerships with Detroit universities. And so, it, it, you know, thinking through the border city aspect of Windsor has for me been kind of a, a, a daily thing. Uh, you know, uh, I'll get into this a little bit later, but just to give a sense of how interconnected the cities are, not only can I see Detroit, but I can sometimes hear Detroit. Uh, the People Mover, which was a, um, a rather, you know, ill thought out scheme, actually, of public transportation. It's just a small loop around the core of uh, central Detroit. Um, not that public transportation is a bad thing, but this particular scheme never particularly worked properly. But I can hear the rails. I can hear it if, a, if, a, if a truck really lays on its horn across in Detroit, I can hear that. If there's a concert, uh, I can hear that. If there's a protest, say about uh, at elections, um, I can hear that as well. So the, the cities are, are, are connected in some, and they're even connected by feel, believe it or not. A couple of years ago, there was something called the Windsor hum, where residents of Windsor said they could feel vibrations. And this is eventually traced back to uh, 
an industrial uh, plant near Detroit. So you can you can hear, see, and until recently you could even feel Detroit, uh, uh, just to give you a sense of how close uh, these cities are. Uh, so this is what I want to do today. I want to talk about the urbanization of international law, the so-called turn to the local in international law. I want to link that to a rising and, and a rising but also long-standing interest in borders that uh, exists in the field of of border studies, and then to bring those fields together to say, okay, we've got the urbanization of international law on one side, some group of people working on that, and then we have the, the border studies people on the other side, uh, and, and, and they don't really meet, and that's the intention of my presentation, is to bring together the local turn in international law together with the more traditional, but I think um, current interest in, uh, in borders, and to look at border cities, which I think are under, underexplored in the literature, and I think in the, in, the, in the live practice as well. And then ask what border cities can tell us about international law, about new urbanism, and so on. Uh, and to do that through a case study of uh, Windsor, Detroit. And I look forward to a discussion. Perhaps some of you out there live in border cities. And of course, even if you don't live in a border city uh, on a map, there are always borders in cities and borders between cities domestically as well. And so that, that, that feeling of living on a border is surely something uh, that we all, uh, we all experience and which manifests itself in unique uh, you know, legal and political and cultural ways uh, wherever we live. So the turn to the local in international law. Now, you know, there'll be some students of history out there who will say there's nothing new about uh, cities being actors in international law. And that's absolutely right, of course. Uh, you know, going back to antiquity, um, going back to you know, Italian city-states, th there's absolutely nothing new in the sense about cities as international actors. But I think it's fair to say that in the post-war 20th century, cities had a very muted role in, uh, in international governance and international diplomacy, uh, in international law. For the most part, cities' relations were centered around sister city relations, and uh, you know, an attempt to uh, to have cultural, economic, uh, student exchanges um, on, on a city to city level. So it's not like international diplomacy is completely new to cities by any means, but we are in a new era, in particular with the rise of global cities, London and New York, and so on. Uh, we are seeing cities take the leadership on the international plane in a way not seen, at least for, for, for a few hundred years. Uh, and and that's, that's interesting. Um, I, and I'll, I'll suggest as well that it's not only global cities, uh, you, you're the mayor of London, for example, chairing uh, C40, uh, uh, the, the group of uh, 40 cities, actually not 97 global cities, and taking, uh, taking center stage on, uh, on climate talks at COP26, but it's also mid-sized cities, uh, small cities as well, making things like climate declarations, um, you know, commitments under the Paris Agreement and so on. Which leads me to the type of topics that cities have been engaging with uh, recently. Now, climate change is, is to the fore right now, and if, if you had to pick one topic around which many cities are engaging in international practices with references to international legal standards, it would surely be climate change. And right now, for example, the global covenant of, of mayors on climate and energy uh, is represented at COP26 in, 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 in Glasgow, but it's not limited to climate by any means. So migration governance, the notion of sanctuary cities uh, for, for uh, undocumented uh, and uh, other types of asylum seekers, uh, issues of human rights, human development. Uh, these are all various issues on which cities have to come together in both formal and informal coalitions to tackle. So there has been an urbanization uh, of international law. And well, of course, you'll recognize the, uh, and, and the folks in the UK may be, you know, uh, maybe oversaturated with that symbol in the top corner uh, of, of COP26. Uh, the image in the bottom corner is from uh, C40 and referencing the hashtag race to zero with respect to zero carbon emissions uh, for cities. And the other image is for the global covenant of mayors. Well, what's going on in the scholarship? It, it, it would not be accurate to say that 
that studies of cities and international law is completely new, uh, but I think it's just starting to uh, just starting to crest, if you will. Uh, so I would say the two seminal works that are out uh, on on cities right now, um, there are others, but these are the two that I that I find particularly useful. Uh, are the Research Handbook on International Law and Cities, edited by Professors Aust and Nyman, and then Droit uh, National des Villes by uh, Anush uh, Bedouin. Bodway, rather. And, and these, these two books are absolutely fantastic and represent a kind of slow, a slow maturing, I would say, of the, of the field of still recent, the recent field of cities and international law. So a, a developing literature on cities and international law on the one hand, uh, and in terms of practice, a really intriguing, um, I think, I, I, I shouldn't say that because I'm contributing to it. So I sound like I'm to my own home, but contributing only in a very small way. But there is now an international law association study group on the role of cities in uh, international law and a really uh, fun uh, project which is going on is that various writers are making city reports, essentially field notes from cities about their engagement with international law. And so here's a small plug for interest in the ILA study group on the role of cities. Uh, and encouragement of uh, folks out there to write about their own city's uh, engagement with international law. And sometimes that engagement is really explicit, right? So, for example, uh, Vienna, uh, uh, which, 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 which defines itself as a city of international law, or The Hague, which self-consciously defines itself as the, the, the city of peace and international justice, or Arusha in Tanzania, which defines itself very much as a sub-Saharan regional hub for, for international law, or uh, other cities, Strasbourg, Graz, and, 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 and so on, which very much self-consciously engage with international law, even though they're not the biggest cities, but you do have these big cities, the New Yorks and the Londons, uh, and uh, the mayor of London, for example, very much in the fore uh, of, of international legal governance, bringing London with them or being brought by London with them, I suppose. But I think there's a whole scope of reports to be written about mid-sized and smaller cities uh, and looking at their practices in the borderlands, so to speak. So I recommend the ILA study group to you and encourage you to consider writing a report your, yourself. So you've got this, you know, a, a look at the practice right, of, of international law and cities. At the same time, there's this other field that exists called border studies. And there are some lawyers, legal academics involved with border studies, but it's a much more interdisciplinary, rooted in, in cultural geography, um, cultural studies, uh, and, and sometimes intersecting with law. Um, but there's this whole field of, of border studies out there. And here you find uh, what I think is a really intriguing mix of approaches to borders. It's all over the map, in other words. On the one hand, you have the idea that borders are somehow quirky and weird. And there's a fascination with places that, to uh, paraphrase from an old BBC show, um, uh, don't exist in some ways or exist in a state of ambiguity. And, and there's this ongoing fascination with, with breakaway republics, microstates. Uh, you know, every, every international law student in the first year of their studies, you know, learns to be a little bit fascinated by the Vatican City, the state, and and so you know microstates, the, the Vanuatu's of the world. These these exist uh, in kind of the imagination as something quirky. Uh, no offense to Vanuatu, that's perhaps a poor example, but nonetheless, these small microstates, especially surrounded by cities, uh, are are seen as, as as quirky. And certainly, the Canada-U.S. border is seen as quirky in a way that's very different from the way the southern border of the United States is seen. So this is a, a podcast I listened to uh, lately from Invisible City, sorry, Invisible 99%. And I'm just going to, to read to you uh, quickly. Now, it's a very NPR-y voice, uh, which I tried to line up, and my technical ability to cut and paste the audio uh, failed. So I'm just going to read it instead in a non-NPR voice. But the United States and Canada, and this is how the, the, the episode begins, share the longest international border in the world. Ever since Canada got the keys to the place in 1867, we've been pretty peaceful and genial neighbors to each other. The previous landlord, Great Britain, well, the US had a bit more of a spotty relationship with them. We invaded them, they burned down our house. It was a whole thing. But even though the border with Canada is now pretty tame, 
When two countries touch each other over a stretch of 5,500 miles, it can result in some surprisingly weird disputes, misunderstandings, geographical quirks, and some really good stories. And that interest in border stories is, I think, something that's uh, penetrated um, you know, current thought and, 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 and popular fiction. Uh, for example, some of you may have seen the uh, U.S. crime series uh, started in 2013 called, uh, called The Bridge, uh, based on uh, a murder that uh, occurs uh, on, on a bridge between Mexico and the United States. And that, in turn, was based on, on the Danish and, and Swedish series of, of, of a similar nature, where there are murders committed on a, on a bridge between those two countries. And so there's a kind of real fascination with the, the quirkiness of borders. At the same time, and especially with a view to the U.S. southern border, there's a very different kind of critical lens which is brought to, to bear. And I just give one example. It's a 2001 book um, called Border and Rule. And, and the author writes, among the other things, the U.S.-Mexico border must be understood not only as a racist weapon to exclude migrants and refugees, but as foundationally organized through and hence inseparable from imperialist expansion, indigenous elimination, and anti-Black enslavement. Now, I, I think it's fair to say that on the northern border, um, there are critical voices as well of border management around things like the, the use of safe con third country um, agreements, uh, caregiver programs, migrant farm workers, uh, and many of these things have come to the fore uh, during the pandemic and exposed some of the fissure cracks. None nonetheless, there's this really fascinating field of border studies, which is, I've learned, all over the map, from the quirkiness of borders to the design of borders, to, uh, very, uh, to very critical uh, perspectives on, on, on borders. Now, I said that earlier on, I said, look, border cities are, are underexplored. It's not to say there's nothing on border cities that you'll find out there. Uh, there is, of course, not only, you know, reference, I have references already, but not only a, a literature on city states uh, that exist, but there's also been, over time, a real interest in places like Trieste or, uh, or Danzig. Uh, but I'm not talking about that primarily. But recently, is there a study of border towns? It's starting. Is there a practice of border towns? It's starting. One could point, for example, to the 2019 creation of the uh, Border Town and Islands Network, uh, which was uh, started by uh, an Italian municipality, Lampedusa and Linosa, uh, and in other members include municipalities in Malta, Cyprus, France, uh, and Hungary, um, uh, among other places. And the network was formed to promote cooperation and support as border cities and islands receiving migrants to Europe and to present a unified voice for these border towns and islands uh, in Brussels and before other international organizations and indeed before domestic authorities. Because, and this will be a recurring theme, border towns are often at the, the sharp end, so to speak, of migration governance, but don't traditionally have much of a voice in national governments or, um, or, or regional organizations or international organizations approach to borders. So there's a massive disconnect between what happens at borders and decisions that are made in, 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 in Brussels, uh, you know, uh, Rome and Budapest and elsewhere. Okay, well, let me get to uh, my case study. And this is what I, what I know in a sense. So there's a, there's a map just to, to place you. Um, and here, this is just a, a bit stunty, if you will. But I just wanted to give you a, a very real sense of how close uh, Windsor is to Detroit. So, for example, from the Ron W. Iani building of the Faculty of Law at Faculty of Law rather at the University of Windsor to our partner school at Detroit Mercy Law, using the tunnel uh, takes 13 minutes. That's in, in, in normal, reasonable traffic during the middle of the day. So, door to door from partner law school to partner law school, uh, 13, 13 minutes. I've made it once from our partner law school to my home in Windsor in seven minutes once. That was a bit of a record for me and I, I hope there's no video evidence of how I, I, I quite did that one. Um, but these cities are very close. The law schools are very close. Our students go back and forth sometimes multiple times a day um, to complete their dual JD degree. I just wanted to give you a kind of really concrete sense of just how uh, related these uh, cities are. 
And the river, which in some ways is presented as a, as a natural border, right? And traditionally, natural borders were oceans, rivers, mountain chains, and so on, it is actually historically, and to some extent today, not at all a natural border. Certainly for the First Nations of this area, the Anishinaabe people, and specifically the Three Fires uh, Confederacy, consisting of the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi peoples, this was not a, 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 a barrier at all. Of course, it was, of course, a highway. And the same was true for the early French settlers of the area. And indeed, the word Detroit, Detroit or Detroit is a derivation of Rivière du Detroit or the river of the strait. This is a, the river is, a, is a, in fact, more accurately described as a strait. Uh, and so it was a conduit rather than a barrier for settlement. The river is, uh, is, is, is over, just over half a kilometer wide at its narrowest. And the cities are, are tangibly close, as I've already uh, suggested. And yet, despite the closeness of these cities, the number of economic links, personal links, intermarriage is very common, dating back and forth is, is, is very common. And during the pandemic, it was actually heartbreaking to see people and families uh, separated. And I know at least one wedding, which happened illegally in the middle of the river on a small island, but we're going <laughs> to leave that one alone. But, but these, these cities are, are really, really integrated. And yet one of the fascinating things is, is that there are no, apparently, if you look through the city's various websites, you'll find very little uh, reference to any kind of formal governance links between the cities. Now, let me say right off the bat that, it, that part of the reason for this is that Windsor is, is, is Detroit's uh, you know, smaller, smaller cousin. Um, like much in the Canada-US relationship, the U.S. matters more to Canada than Canada matters to the U.S. And, and Detroit is, is uh, you know, Detroit, Windsor, Detroit matters more to Windsor than Windsor matters to Detroit, I think it's fair to say. But nonetheless, it's surprising to me that there are so few governance links, um, given the, you know, the fact that, the, for example, both are car towns and car parts go back and forth multiple times until they, they end up being uh, spat out as, uh, as actual actual cars. There are some links on a governance level, but they happen in very informal ways or through what has been called uh, authorities. So not necessarily formal governance institutions, but what would you call the tunnel corporation? The corporation that operates the tunnel at arm's length to both the cities of Detroit and Windsor. It's owned by the city of Windsor on one side, but owned by a private corporation on the other side. Uh, I would call that, or, and others have called it, uh, in particular, I'm thinking of the work of, uh, uh, of uh, Professors Valverde and, and Flynn, who suggested an article, article focused on Toronto, but with implications for most cities, that, quote, special purpose public authorities are ubiquitous, indeed are more numerous than governments. Some are time limited, say in urban development, corporations set up to revitalize a particular urban section, intersection rather, but many are ongoing, such as transit, housing and conservation authorities and public utilities. And there are many of these kinds of authorities which, which exist on the border, but you don't often find reference to them if you're doing a, a troll of the city's official websites. But harbor masters in regular contact with each other, police, Search and rescue. There are even um, there are even informal agreements for emergency services for firefighting. Firefighting uh, should come to that um, a, a, across the the river or this or the strait. Um, a an a, an annual international marathon, which involves really thick agreement and and cooperation between authorities on and non governmental authorities on both sides of the uh, of the river. Practical diplomacy takes place on, on actually a really large scale. Now, this binational city governance is certainly not always apparent or transparent, but it certainly exists and exists along multiple uh, points of contact. And often these links rely on what has been called border spanners. And I particularly like the term spanner in the Windsor Detroit context because both are industrial cities. And so I, I like the, the reference there to a to a, a, you know, a tool, uh, but border spanners impact what happens in these authorities on both sides of the river. Let me give a couple of examples. Well, let me give one, start with one example. 
there is a new bridge being built um, downstream. The Ambassador Bridge, which you can see on this map, is actually privately owned, and the bridge is in some state of disrepair. And so the Canadian government has wanted to build uh, a new bridge. Now, again, the Americans weren't particularly interested, and so Canada is paying entirely for the bridge on its own. Uh, but the bridge itself is an example of an innovative and collaborative kind of border management between Canada and the U.S. The Bridge Authority is a not-for-profit Canadian Crown Corporation owned by the Canadian government, but it is established in an agreement between Canada and a subnational uh, uh, entity, namely the state of Michigan, so not, not even the United States. So there's this authority, this bridge authority, this bridge authority. And as it stands right now, there's no way to engage in active transportation across the river. Detroit has a fantastic cycling scene, but if I want to go over there, uh, I, I can't ride there. I can't walk there. I used to be able to walk and ride across the bridge. You haven't been able to do that since about the early 80s. So there's no way to engage in active transportation. But a coalition uh, of boundary spanners on both sides of the river lobbied the bridge authority, the new bridge, to uh, allow for active transportation. And the new bridge, when it's built in a couple of years, I, construction has already started, will have pedestrian lanes, it will have bike lanes, and these will be free. Let me give another example of how border spanners interact with formal governance mechanisms. So you have these formal governance mechanisms, right? Uh, US, Mexico, Canada agreement, the new NAFTA, I like to call it CUSMA, it's the, it's the starting with Canada, since it's not formally spelled out in the treaty, how the treaty should be called. So CUSMA, the Canada, US, Mexico uh, agreement, the new NAFTA, obviously is a binational or, or governance scheme. Um, another binational governance scheme is the International Joint Commission, uh, which controls water resources, uh, shared water resources between Canada and the U.S. This is comprised of commissioners appointed from Ottawa and appointed from Washington. None of the current commissioners, last time I checked, had anything to do with uh, Detroit or Windsor, and yet make uh, decisions having to do with water diversion and other aspects of shared uh, water governance. In a sense, then, the cities are entirely cut out from these kinds of um, binational governance mechanisms that are put in place. And yet, nonetheless, through border spanners and informal mechanisms, the, uh, the IJC, the International Joint Commission, is influenced by the cities. And several sustainability schemes have been uh, put in place following lobbying and consultation and engagement with coalitions of environmentalists on both sides of the border. So if you were to look for formal governance schemes between Canada and Detroit, you wouldn't find it. If you looked at the minutes of the International Relations Committee of the City of Windsor, you find virtually no reference whatsoever to Detroit. You find lots of reference to our city, sister cities, including in Poland uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Korea, uh, and one in the United States, but nowhere near the Canada-US border. Okay. This next photo is a picture of uh, the mayor of Detroit, Coleman Young, very famous long, long serving mayor Coleman Young on the, on the right, and on the left, uh, the Windsor mayor, uh, Bert Weeks, and I think it was taken in the early 80s as well. This is a rare formal meeting between mayors, and it uh, was followed by meetings between city councils as well. But this kind of thing happens exceedingly rarely. As far as I can tell, it's happened three times in the, uh, in the, in the history of, of, of Windsor and Detroit. It's not to say that, it, that, that there isn't scope for it or that it doesn't happen in formal ways. So for example, Windsor and Detroit put in a joint bid to be Amazon, North America's Amazon headquarters, but it happens very rarely. Really the, the governance between Windsor and Detroit happens through these boundary spanners. It happens through uh, informal governance, which is, uh, which is thick and real, but not always uh, transparent. Uh, and you know, and as, I, as I mentioned, Detroit matters more to Windsor than vice versa. And there's also a, you know, a transnational unease which permeates interactions between the two cities, border securitization post 9-11, racial profiling, other structural barriers to access for uh, marginalized communities, including passport requirements, crossing fees. Uh, and as I mentioned, the current lack of access to transportation links there are trade frictions, America first policies, uh, and vacillations of perceptions of Detroit in Windsor. Uh, and they vacillate between the idea of Detroit as being bankrupt and depopulated and crime ridden, uh, 
or the great American comeback story, the next Brooklyn. And there are, there are racial dynamics at the play in how the city is, uh, is perceived in, in, in Windsor for sure. But these are some of the reasons for simultaneous division as well as integration. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the number of border crossings has been on decline in recent years, even before the pandemic. And despite the extent of the economic and cultural linking of the cities, in some ways, both cities are on their own national peripheries. Right? And they need each other. They are in some ways parts of a hinterland, like many border cities, and there's a 20-year-old uh, EU study on, on marginalization of EU borderlands and, 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 and border cities, which is an exception to, the, to what I mentioned earlier when I said there's very little out there on, 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 uh, on cities and international law. But, but border cities are almost by their nature marginalized in peripheral places. Not, exclu not exclusively, right? One can think of Bratislava, for example, as a city which is, which is very central, both as a border city and, and as, as, a, as a capital. But, but, but nonetheless, uh, you know, these are cities uh, which in some ways are on their own periphery and need each other. They need to engage in intercity diplomacy um, in order to move forward as, as a region. And, and certainly the city of Windsor has, has, has recently adopted that approach in, its, in a report called the Windsor Works Project, which recognizes that Windsor's future in, in many ways depends on, on what happens in Detroit. But beyond the local, I think there's real potential here for border cities to act as interpreters for entries at a binational level. And as dampeners of international tension and conflict. And I'll just give a really small example, uh, but one which I think is, is concrete and indicative. So there are, of course, uh, binational governance schemes in terms of who gets across the border. And these include not only passportization, but fast entry schemes such as Nexus, right? Pre-clearance, that sort of thing. We even have security personnel co-located on both sides of the border. If I want to renew my Nexus card, it's a binational scheme, but I go over to the US uh, to do it, and there I'll find a Canadian customs officer. So that's just how integrated the binational these, 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 these programs are. But if I have, a, when I was dean, if I had difficulty with a student crossing, so for example, during Trump's Muslim ban, I was not on the phone to Ottawa per se. I was on the phone to a problem solvers at the border uh, who were able to, uh, to make things happen for, for individuals. Uh, and you know, in some ways, the, the marginalization of embassies is, 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 is not a new story by any means. But one of the reasons I think that happens is because of the informal governance schemes which actually happen uh, at borderlands. And I think engaging border cities around international legal standards in a way that hasn't really happened yet. Uh, I think is, has huge potential for issues such as climate change in the Great Lakes region and beyond. That's the Gordie Howe Bridge, which will have active transportation on it as a result of the border spanners engaging with the uh, bridge authority. Uh, the pandemic certainly threw a wrench into, or a spanner into relations between uh, Detroit and Windsor. The international marathon, which ran over the bridge and back through the tunnel, if I recall correctly, uh, you know, has come to a halt. Uh, but one of the things you've seen is these coalitions getting together to lobby national uh, figures in both countries. So whether it's respect to testing or with respect to uh, vaccination, at one point, Windsor's mayor suggested that people should get vaccinated on the border because Michigan had an excess of vaccine. We didn't have enough here. So he suggested that we should get vaccinated on, on, on the border itself. Um, groups such as uh, um, Chambers of Commerce have called on US and national and, and, and Canadian authorities to make uh, transit much more easier, much, much easier. And Windsor Council has asked the federal government to cancel costly border crossing testing requirements. Now the border will reopen, our land border will reopen in a few days, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, I wanna get, get back to Detroit uh, and, uh, and, and embrace everything the, the border city life has, has to offer. Now I focused on 
on the Windsor, Detroit, simply because that's what I know best. But I think there's a huge scope to uh, look at border cities. And certainly Windsor and Detroit haven't been alone in terms of border cities struggling with the pandemic and their location on a border. Take, for example, the Chinese cities of Yuvi uh, on the Myanmar border, where you have a city of millions locked down now for 200, 200 days. So this is by no means uh, you know, unique to Windsor and, and Detroit, but the peripheralization of border cities also creates an opportunity for them to act in coalition, uh, both binational but on an international stage as well. So to wrap up, I would say four things. First of all, border cities are underexplored and have the potential to bring together border studies and the turn to the local and international law in a really intriguing way. Secondly, the rich, informal, by city, city to city relationships which exist are facilitated by boundary spanners uh, and authorities exist which do not appear in formal governance uh, charts. And these are also worth uh, looking at more closely, not only, you know, not only for the practical interest, but because they act as influencers and interpreters for binational uh, governance schemes. And finally, that the informal role is not enough to further uh, regional needs, whether around the pandemic or around sustainability and climate change. But there's a potential, in, uh, in an enormous potential for border cities to, to rise to the fore in terms of dealing with some of the big challenges of livability, sustainability. And I think taking city to city governance to the next level and engaging with international standards, whether that be the Paris Agreement um, or, or uh, human rights uh, conventions and so on, offer, uh, offers a, a real potential for border cities to, to, to uh, come back from peripheralization and marginalization and to really be at the fore of some of these discussions. Well, Carl, I think I'll stop there, but, uh, but thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, and if you want to stop sharing your screen uh, so we can engage in conversation and I can uh, encourage uh, any of our audience members to send uh, uh, questions in uh, through the Q&A function, which I will moderate. But uh, it's an opportunity for me to begin with some questions and comments. And of course, I, I couldn't help but be reminded of my, uh, uh, my Windsor Detroit border story. Uh, from from many years ago, when I had the great pleasure to to visit you in in Windsor, and uh, my partner and I, just, at my instigation, decided that we had to go visit, had to go across the border to see Detroit, because as you say, it is it's just across the river. It seems ridiculous not to 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 go across. And traveling as we were on on UK passports, um, and we took the tunnel bus. Uh, which is, um, you know, it's it's all it's luxury all the way for for <laughs> us. Uh, we had to fill out a um, visa waiver form, a U.S. So we had faced the full uh, magnitude of, despite these quite seemingly integrated cities, faced the full wrath of U.S. Uh, immigration controls. And on the U.S. entry form, it says your destination. And of course, we said, but we're not going anywhere. We're simply going to see Detroit. And then we're coming back. And we had this long, seemingly existential conversation, which involved the customs inspector saying, or passport inspector saying, you have to be going somewhere, which, you know, and eventually we we asked her, well, is there somewhere where you'd suggest we should go? And we'll write that down. To which she said, you could go to the Chrysler building. And we said, okay, we'll write that down. And she said, are you just saying that because I told you to? <laughs> and we said, yes, <laughs> but, but I promise we will go there, um, which we did actually. Uh, but it did, it, it, it demonstrated the kind of ridiculousness of this mixture of the national and the local. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's it's really interesting, Carl. And you, you, you know, I remember when we first moved to Windsor, we were crossing uh, into Detroit, and the customs officer. So Detroit is a really racially divided city in in, in many ways. Um, and the customs officer, uh, who was white, said, "Where are you going?" We said, "Well, we're going 
similar to what you did downtown Detroit, go for a walk, just, you know, explore. You know, when you go to the border, where is the border, right? You, just, you wanted to check out the border and the border city. But we had the same experience. He goes, why would you want to do that? You know, he basically go to the suburbs. Uh, and, and, and so you had, you know, someone who in some ways should have been a, well, I mean, it's, it's naive to think that customs officers should ever represent their country, right? Why would we ever expect to, have to, 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 to hear from uh, polite uh, border officials? But, but nonetheless, it was, this, it, was, it, was, it was a very weird um, localization of Detroit, divisions in Detroit being played out at an, international, at an international border. I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about in, my, in the presentation at all was that Canada and the U.S. at the border and in border cities across the, the, uh, the border are also links for vice. Um, you know, Windsor and Detroit have a long history of smuggling. And you can think of actors such as, uh, you know, Al Capone, who apparently visited Windsor on various occasions, and Detroit's Purple Gang and sneaking uh, booze during Prohibition across the river in Model T's uh, driving across the ice or women sewing um, extra compartments into their, into their dresses and, and overcoats in order to smuggle uh, booze across. And in many ways, um, you know, smuggling is, a, is frankly a way of life in, in, in Windsor and Detroit. So there are, we're linked by economies of, of vice as well. And sometimes the vice is, uh, you know, it, it, it's only that. It's only not wanting to pay duty. Um, but it's also a much more serious involves you know, weapons smuggling, uh, people smuggling, um, and, and, and so on. But at that low level of vice, if you're from Windsor and Detroit, there's a kind of informal governance at the border too, where once you say you're from Windsor, you say you're from Detroit, you're allowed a certain amount of smuggling. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous to say, but, but there's a kind of um, acceptance of small v vice uh, at the border um, and a distrust of, uh, of folks who a greater scrutiny and distrust of folks who are from around here, so to speak. So here you have, in one sense, nothing gets more binational or state-oriented than a border, right? And border guards who are hired by their federal governments. And yet there's a kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, which goes on when you're a, a local resident and which, uh, you know, of course, there are you know, issues of privilege around there in terms of who gets that kind of treatment and so on. But nonetheless, our vice economies are linked as well. And there's a different kind of scrutiny uh, uh, that occurs informally of people who don't come from the border cities. At least that's been my experience. I mean, that also ties into borders as, and, and cities across the border. And I get, I'm sure, I mean, this no doubt works one way as between Canada and the US. I don't suspect it doesn't work the other way around. As sites of fantasy that, mm. you know, it seems to me Detroit uh, from the perspective of the Canadian side, it's probably always been a, a kind of a site for the um, uh, the imaginary of of mm -hmm. of the American city. And I mean, uh, clearly, like all imaginaries, all fantasies, there's no doubt a racial connotation mm -hmm. rolled up in that as well. But a kind of site of all kinds of exciting things that. Or possibly dangerous, possibly dangerous and exciting things mm -hmm. uh, happening in in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And and you see in some border crosses that imaginary that or that 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 wish to take this to an imaginary level, almost a disnification of borders as well, occurring in some places. So I I, I want to say it's Tijuana, but I, I I could be wrong. I'd have to get the reference to anyone who's interested. But there, you know, one Mexican city. Uh, you know, some some years ago, before before certainly before Trump had created a, a binational peace plaza, uh, which was extraordinary from a design perspective, an extraordinary public undertaking, um, and, and, and certainly you know you can find that along the Canada U.S. border as well, uh, a peace garden in British Columbia, which the Invisible ninety nine percent podcast talks about as being this kind of lawless land where even during the pandemic, they couldn't shut it down. Uh, why? Because if they did, it would automatically trigger provisions of a treaty, which, uh, you know, large parts of Ontario and Maine would have to be switched. There's all kinds of mythologies around the border. It's complete nonsense. There's all kinds of mythologies around the border, which exist in this imaginary sphere as well. Uh, and sometimes, the, you know, you know, sometimes Canadianization and Americanization are, are 
are merged. Uh, certainly, you know, in Windsor, we're more likely to use imperial measurements for temperature than, than metric ones, even though the rest of Canada is on metric. You're, it's, it's annoyingly so to me, you hear uh, Detroit radio ubiquitously, even in Canadian government offices. And so there's an Americanization of, of Canada in the border town to some extent, but it also really highlights differences as well. And so just to bring this back to, to legal education in a sense, our, our students uh, who are enrolled in our dual JD program will really insist that learning law in the U.S. is a very different thing from learning law in Canada. Uh, and um, there's a, a kind of tendency uh, to, to, to also in a border city really highlight difference, highlight national difference, uh, and, to, and to kind of figuratively play in that uh, imaginative borderland between, between the countries, as well as the physical border, which sometimes can be really ugly from a design perspective uh, in particular. I have a question if, uh, from Helmut, uh, who wanted your thoughts on the role of international agreements enabling transfrontier cooperation. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Helmut. Yeah, I mean, certainly in, in Canada and the U.S. now with the new NAFTA, uh, KUSMA, there are you know, a host of measures in place to, uh, to allow for the, the passage of, of goods. Uh, and there are also these you know, pre, pre-clearance schemes. Um, there are North American content rules, which, you know, despite Trump's uh, bravado, actually has served to, in, to further integrate the uh, North American economies. And, and certainly from the perspective of parts manufacturers in this area has been, you know, Kuzma has been, has been excellent for, for cross-border mobility. But I, I think, uh, you know, so, th- so there are these binational schemes that certainly uh, exist around trade, around preclearance, around co-location of, of, of security, uh, and so on. But there's also, for me, an interesting aspect that I, I hadn't talked about in the, in the presentation at all, um, but which is that cities don't have any constitutional mandate in most places to do anything in the international sphere at all. Uh, they don't have a constitutional mandate to make, uh, to make you know, agreements. Um, and, you know, in, indeed, a, a recent Canadian Supreme Court judgment, uh, which had to do with the province of Ontario tinkering with the size of Toronto City, City Council, uh, said very clearly, cities in Canada are the creatures of provinces. They have no independent standing. They can't go their own way. Uh, and uh, the province doesn't put it in your enabling legislation. You can't do it. Uh, but as others have pointed out, uh, and, and this is, I think, true across uh, you know, many countries, certainly uh, federal countries where, uh, where, where cities are, are, are creatures of the subnational level, are subnational levels of government, one step removed from foreign relations. But nonetheless, uh, you know, if, just because your enabling legislation doesn't specifically say you can do it, doesn't mean you can do it. It doesn't mean you can't do it, rather. Uh, and so you have cities rising to the fore and saying, well, until someone stops me, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, to work at the that work on international agreements, uh, on, on city-to-city governance, uh, and um, you know, as long as as long as no higher level of government forbids me from from doing it, we're just going to uh, we're just going to to undertake it. So I suppose a very com- convoluted answer to Helmut's uh, question, but these binational capital capital schemes uh, certainly certainly exist and provide a framework. Um, again, I would give the example of the International Joint Commission, but there are others, uh, other regimes which, which manage water in the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, and so these, these schemes exist, but how local actors engage with them, shape them, interpret them, is, is, is very much on a practical basis something that, um, something that not only can massage these agreements, but in fact results in very different outcomes depending on, on where along the border you are. Um, and, uh, and and certainly, you know, cities don't have a formal role in the design of these of these binational schemes. But I think that's an area where they probably should. And, and nowhere was that brought more home than in the pandemic, where decisions were being made in Ottawa and Washington about land crossings in Windsor. And so, you know, if you wanted to see your your new child in in Detroit, people were driving to Toronto 
flying to Detroit, but they couldn't cross, they couldn't take the 13 minute trip across the tunnel. Why? Because these decisions were made made in, in nation's capitals rather than along the border. And I think there's a growing recognition that leaving it to binational governance uh, for mobility is no longer uh, you know, a sufficient solution. But, and that does uh, suggest to me, and, and this was a point I thought about during your talk, is there, there's a kind of uneasiness and a tension between, uh, on the one hand, there's a big drive, certainly in the UK, to sort of empower the local, um, to try to have more empowered municipalities, elected more elected mayors throughout the country, but also a deep, at the same time, a real unease should those mayors um, try to take up a role on the international stage, even mm-hmm. though, of course, the present prime minister wasn't an elected mayor uh, at one time. But, you know, and this this is a tension, I think, that comes up. And that's um, it particularly is is interesting in the case of London, which, as you rightly describe, is, is a global city, but yet has no kind of, uh, and, and to some extent, the mayor is able to uh, have a have a, a global stage and and certainly attracted a fair bit of attention from the previous president uh, of the United States, but um, uh, but it, but it is a real tension uh, in terms of you know as you describe it uh, cities as being uh, in the Canadian context creatures of the subnational, which sounds a bit like a some kind of gothic horror film. Um, <laughs> But then again, it's worth pointing out that originally the Canadian provinces were intended to be, quote unquote, glorified municipalities. Mm -hmm. So um, I think your paper nicely illustrates this kind of tension at the heart of cities as players on the international stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly, certainly in Canada at Confederation in 1867, Municipalities were the lo- were the losers in the uh, in the agreement between between the colonies or then you know what were to become provinces and and the federal government. Um, you know, municipalities were certainly the losers, and 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 in one sense, you know, given that border cities almost by definition exist on the periphery, they're going to continue to be marginalized, and I think that's one reason why uh, you know agreements and formal governance mechanisms. Can you know, city to city, can actually have a much greater, much greater sway. If if the Detroit Windsor region were speaking with one voice um, to both the national governments, as they have on water governance, for example, or other forms of sustainability around the Great Lakes, I think there'd be much greater uh, scope for you know to 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 be listened to be listened to. But you're right, Carl. There is this kind of uh, tension between. Um, empowering cities and certainly, you know, certainly, you know, governments around the world are recognized that cities are really drivers in many ways of not only things like economic growth, but also, uh, you know, carbon and carbon reduction. And they need cities, they need cities. And governments around the world, are, you know, are, 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 are in some ways pumping money into, in, 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 into local governments. And in the case of Canada, in some ways trying to bypass the provinces to have a direct federal city relationship on matters such as uh, housing uh, and, and and climate change. So, you know, it, it, we're very much seeing, I think, uh, a sort of, uh, you know, rebirth of the city in the idea, in, in the eyes of the federal government. But I, I should be really clear about something. In terms of the practice of law at the national stage, if you ask your Ministry of Foreign Affairs lawyers, you know, do you engage with cities? The answer Certainly in Canada, and I suspect the answer is true for many places around the world, is no. Uh, you know, they'll reluctantly admit that they engage with, uh, reluctant, they'll admit that they engage with provinces in memoranda of understandings and arrangements, not agreements or treaties, but there's a kind of recognition that they have to deal with subnational entities, namely provinces, in terms of treaty implementation, given at least in Canada the, the, you know, the dualist nature of the way we receive international law. But there is virtually no engagement in most countries between ministries of foreign affairs, certainly, you know, at a, at a legal level as opposed to a policy level, and, um, and cities. Now, I, I'd love to hear if anyone, you know, on the, um, on the webinar had, had other experiences, but that's certainly my, my sense uh, of that kind of relationship. So 
a growing link on a policy level, but still on the legal level, a real reluctance, and understandable in some way. You have, you know, you, if you're the, if states are the primary actors in international law, there's a reluctance to allow other actors to take center stage. And, uh, you know, it's already hard enough to, to wrangle provinces or states if you're in a federal system, let alone have to do so with cities as well. But there is that kind of disconnect. We have a really uh, interesting question uh, from Anna, Anna Sergei, who's a professor of criminology at the University of Essex. And Anna works on mafias and organized crime. And in particular, she's working on traditional mafia groups in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, a, city, a city I have some memory of. Uh, and when doing that, uh, she met, uh, I'm at the border with uh, Buffalo, New York, and uh, she's arguing for a mafia borderland identity on the basis of studies on border security and border effect, which looks at how the border affects culture, identity, including criminal identity, and a general understanding and acceptance of diversity. Uh, she notes from a legal perspective, there's a huge difference between organized crime law enforcement or cr law against uh, sorry law enforcement against organized crime and mafia between Ontario uh, and New York. They would need borderland police forces and therefore borderland legal framework. To what, to what extent do you think this would be viable? Uh, because the way she sees it, the border is a facilitator of mafia different flags and identities and their hybridization is not understood well on either side of the border by law enforcement. Mm, interesting. I, 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 Anna or Professor Sergei, I'd certainly be interested in hearing more about your work, and I, I, I'd love if you could send me a, a link to something you may have done on this, or we could be in touch offline. I, I haven't thought this through at all. Uh, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably misperceiving what you're suggesting, but I certainly think it would be problematic to have organized crime involved in any kind of, um, you know, gov governance uh, scheme. Uh, we, you know, and, and it, it actually troubles me at some level that we mythologize um, things like rum running, you know, uh, you know, in my neighborhood, my neighborhood was literally built on, 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 on whiskey. It's, uh, it's called, it's, it's in Windsor, but it's an area called Walkerville and um, Walker ran a distillery. And, uh, you know, you, you know, I look at my window sometimes and see, a trolley bus coming by, taking people around to learn about rum running. Al Capone, um, you know, visited uh, something that's now called the Paul Martin House, uh, but used to be owned by a gangster named Harry Lowe. Uh, and Harry Lowe was a notorious, uh, you know, rum runner on the side of the border with links to Chicago and Detroit uh, mafias. But, you know, the, the, the violence that is entailed with these kind of mafia bilateral relationships, I think is sometimes mythologized and, uh, and, and softened in a way that becomes palatable. And, and so I, you know, I, and actually I find that kind of, kind of troubling in some ways. Yeah. I think, I think the question was really about whether you need a special kind, a special form of policing. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I completely misunderstood. <laughs> My apologies. Yeah. I think that, you know, that, that's really interesting because, uh, you know, you, you, I think if you're from outside Canada, you you, you think that um, well, maybe I'm being new, but that there'll be Mounties, the RCMP will be uh, you know uh, everywhere, and uh, you know they're only they're they're limited to you know the areas in which they work and the, the topics in which they they work on, um, but certainly our so our federal police are are really not visible here in a border city in a way that you might expect them to be. And, uh, you know, a, a police force like Windsor uh, and our court system, you know, they, they develop certain expertises. Um, you know, uh, private international law is done really well here in Windsor. If you, you, if you were married in Windsor and want to divorce in Detroit and you're, you know, and, you're, you're, you, and there's a custody battle, I think Windsor lawyers, border lawyers know this work better than anyone. And Windsor police are, you know, given that we're only in mid-sized cities, have, a, have an extraordinary uh, knowledge of things like uh, you know gun running and, and that sort of thing, but there is a you know there's there is a weird policing governance gap, if you will, uh, at the border uh, and and certainly behind the scenes, I know the RCMP is, is there working, but they're not they don't have a real visibility in, in the border town in which you, you might think they 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 would. Uh, 
you know, and you have the you know you have pre clearance and co localization of um, of security guards, uh, not security guards, rather customs officers at the border. Uh, I think a lot of Canadians and perhaps Americans too become uncomfortable with some of the implications for sovereignty in in you know, in, in supra policing. In that sense, um, it was a, it was a long battle before customs officers in Canada got to uh, carry weapons, for example. Uh, so I don't know, I want to think that one through, through more, but thank you so much for the question. It's really not something I've, I've thought through. I mean, what, another thing that struck me is, do border cities have the potential uh, for us to really think differently about borders? Um, you know, there's a tendency, and certainly, goodness knows, we've seen this in the, in the UK with Brexit, to, to fetishize the idea of of borders as being kind of the the hard border, um, and I've certainly seen it uh, argued that in the way in which, for example, we understand the EU, we should think of it much more as a kind of frontier rather than a border, where kind of where the EU's juris you know influence and jurisdiction mm. ends is not you know, clear cut, it kind of fades gradually out um, on the horizon. Uh, the, and that also makes me think of some of the um, kind of, um, I suppose, cultural studies work on borderlands as being kind of places of the in-between of, mm-hmm. the, of, the, of hybridity. And I mean, do you think border cities actually have that potential? Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously not in the way in which I described my experience of crossing the border, but potentially of this kind of mixing of uncertainty, of hybridity and in-betweenness and, and of borders as not being as clear cut as the imaginary often makes them out to be. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, there, and there's certainly a fetishization of, uh, to some extent, in, in, in both directions at this border, and perceptions of both cities vastly broadly in uh, in the minds of Windsorites and and, and Detroiters, uh, and some of those some of those are, are economic, some of those are are, are racial, uh, some of those are um, you know are, are are influenced by the very fact that there's, there is a very hard border. There's lots of places along the 49th parallel between Canada and the U.S. where you can just, you know, you can you can slip across the border, and the only thing that separates it is a, a clear-cut path of forest, perhaps a, a border marker every hundred yards or something like that. But there's no missing the border and the hardness of the border at the, uh, you know, at, at, at Windsor and Detroit. And there's something, you know, there's lots of people who who uh, who, who want to go just across, you know, like you're not you're not alone. You weren't alone, Carl. In fact, you know, Windsorites will sometimes. Go across ostensibly to buy cheap gas or groceries, but there's something transfrontierly transgressive about about uh, you know going to another going to another country. And uh, I, I mean, certainly as, as dean uh, at Windsor Law, it felt like uh, you know I was engaging with our Detroit partners felt like the right thing to do and taking advantage of our of our border location in terms of linking. Uh, our clinics so that we could deal with things like, um, you know, um, migration issues better for clients that were going back and forth or to deal with Great Lakes environmental issues and so on. So there was certainly that interest, but there was also something I was really keen to go over to Detroit every chance I got. It, uh, it, it felt, uh, you know, it, it felt kind of, uh, there's a weird refresh that happens when you cross a border, despite all the nastiness of border crossings and, the, you know, the, the rude, rude guards and, and submission to arbitrary search and seizure. I'll never forget, uh, shortly after we moved to Windsor, I was driving across the border and the US Customs Guard said, oh, so you teach in the uh, that dual JD program? And I said, well, sometimes, yeah. And, and he said, what's the only US constitutional right that does not apply at the border? And I said, I just played dumb, although I didn't know actually, but I played dumb and said, uh, I have no idea officer. And he says, it's the right against unreasonable search and seizure. And <laughs> there is sometimes, you know, despite the coziness of the Canada-U.S. border, uh, sometimes an interest in in hardening that that border, and, and perhaps in some ways that frisson of, uh, of, of of dangerous border crossing uh, 
uh, and Frontierland uh, enters the popular psyche. It's, I, I want to think about that one more, but that, that's my, those are some of my initial reflections. Uh, yeah, that just makes me think of some of those early Canadian charter cases on unreasonable search and seizure that mm-hmm. I'll just move right, moving <laughs> right along. Um, but on this sort of subject, the question from Jill Marshall from uh, Royal Holloway School of Law, um, is it difficult to move across the border for students, others who aren't Canadian or U.S. passport holders, which is kind of as per my, my story? And does that create a sense of exclusion? I mean, it'd be interesting to hear you speak about whether you have students that might be non-Canadian, non-U.S. passport holders. And also, is there an increase in any research on the use of technology to record movements across the border, including mm-hmm. in official documents? Yeah. Thanks for that question. It, it certainly it, it certainly is uh, more difficult for students who aren't uh, Canadian or American, and the, and the vast majority of the students in the dual JD program are actually Canadian. But we do have um, you know you know an important American uh, representation as well. Where it becomes tricky, and where it became very tricky, was uh, during the Trump administration's uh, Muslim ban, when suddenly our students from Iran and Iraq were very much uh, prevented from 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 uh, from crossing, um, and it, it was great to see actually students rally to support each other uh, during this period. But you know, as I said to students at the time, the pro- uh, the, the relaunch of our of our dual JD program came came just before 9/11, and then we and we survived survived 9/11 despite people getting trapped on on, on different sides between a, you know a, a vast hard, hardening of the border. You used to be able to cross with, I mean, I'm being facetious a little bit, but if you had a library card, you know, you'd be able to cross and they would often wave you through even without checking ID. Um, and that's certainly not the case uh, post, post, post 9-11. Uh, and it's certainly not the case, um, you know, it certainly wasn't the case during the Trump administration. Um, and, you know, there, there, there is a weird um, trickle down approach to how officials at the border Treat you depending on and, and and treat our students depending on on uh, what regime is in power in, in Washington. This is a very strange trickle down trickle down there. And and and, and you know we we rely on what I would call border spanners, uh, a lawyer who knows people at the border who makes phone calls to uh, to help um, mitigate uh, crossings for uh, for individuals who who um, you know who are who are who are facing. Uh, difficulties or arbitrary, uh, arbitrarily being prevented from crossing for whatever reason. And, and, and certainly, you know, I, I, I'm not, this, is, this is not sort of video on the video surveillance issue, but we've had issues with, for example, border guards wanting to see students' laptops, cell phones, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing, looking for photos. And this is not for our students, but, but more, more broadly, uh, in terms of these kinds of seizures of electronic device, Looking for things like uh, drug use, photos of drug use, um, and 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 that thing, sort of things. So, real uh, fishing expeditions for for you know illicit behavior, vice, uh, and uh, an attempt to to control you know um, undesirable people from 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 crossing the border. And there's there's uh, unmistak- unmistakably you know profiling which occurs in this regard as well. So. It, it, it's it's not always easy, um, and and the pandemic highlighted that as well. But the pandemic also highlighted that there were workarounds, um, you know, as as it has for all of us. Um, and, and that the and one of the things for me that's been so interesting is to see that that, that the border nature of Windsor and Detroit has remained strong despite the fact that the land border has essentially been closed to non-essential travel, um, you know, for the last year and a half or whatever it is. But every day, still, hundreds of Windsor nurses go take their go to their jobs in Detroit hospitals. We still listen to Detroit radio. Um, goods never stop moving, uh, and so, for example, you, you know, um, there's a there's a huge one thing I didn't talk about as well, but uh, huge diasporic connections between Canada and, and between Windsor and Detroit. So, uh, really um, large Middle Eastern population in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit, uh, and um, not coincidentally. Uh, a very large Middle Eastern population in, in Windsor. And when I go to the store to buy my uh, pita bread, for example, it was probably baked fresh in Detroit uh, that morning. So th- these links are really deep um, and have survived the pandemic. Uh, and, and so the richness of that is uh, is really intriguing to me. But but uh, with respect to the, uh, 
the question, there's certainly that uh, questions of over surveillance, over police, you know, um, over uh, over policing uh, are certainly omnipresent as well. And there's a weird kind of ping pong that happens there. So uh, my my question for you is uh, in terms of kind of where your your relationship so you live in Windsor I know you have a strong relationship to Toronto you've talked about your relationship to Detroit how do these two kind of ident you know are these two identities that that coexist quite happily for you or uh uh Detroit's a lot closer to, to than Toronto, mm -hmm. um, but I, I do remember certainly when you first moved to Windsor that that you you see you said you were traveling to Toronto uh, much more often than you were going to Detroit. So is it a strange experience being kind of in between these two major cities? It, it is. It is strange, uh, and uh, you know. <laughs> When I lived when I lived near London, I we had we had we never knew we had so many friends. People were constantly coming, constantly coming to visit and stay. And uh, when we found we, we moved to uh, to Windsor, um, <laughs> all, those, all those friends wanted to come and visit and stay. And so I had to go to Toronto a lot to uh, you know keep up uh, family and, and 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 friendship ties. But as my old supervisor at McGill, uh, Rod McDonald said, Rod, Rod taught at Windsor before moving to uh, to Montreal. Uh, he said, if you if if you think Toronto is going, and this is for, for you know for non Canadians, apologies, but Canadians, uh, you know, Torontonians often think of Tro as the or, or, or Pillory as thinking of Toronto as the center of the universe. He says, if you if you think of Toronto as being the center of the universe, you're going to be really unhappy in Windsor. But if you explore what there is to on offer, uh, you know, in the area. You're gonna you're gonna love it, and that's certainly being true. And and so, for example, Chicago is equidistant uh, to Toronto, and uh, you know, Detroit right across the border. And you know that kind of uh, there's a kind of Rust Belt chic in this in this area, which has been which has been uh, fun to explore. And certainly, you know, our students in the in the dual JD program, many of whom come from Toronto, uh, you know, find find meaningful legal work in the states where you know where unmet legal need is massive it is in canada as well but it certainly is in the states and working in you know having opportunities that they they wouldn't have in canada on clinical work such as working with a veterans clinic um you know um or um you know courts in the u.s being much more open to internships in many ways so there's a kind of i don't want to call it legal tourism because that belittles it and 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 and, and uh reflects on motives and so on, but but there is a kind of uh, legal sampling which you know which which existence on the border here allows you as well. In some ways, you know, to be away from Ottawa in terms of being an international lawyer in Canada uh, is difficult. Is difficult, right? Because that's where international law, if you think of states as being the chief architects of international law, uh, if that's where international law resides in Canada, then being you know several hundred kilometers away is is, is difficult in terms of having currency and maintaining contacts and so on. But if you think of the fact that we're on an international border and just down the road uh, is the highest trade uh, crossing by volume anywhere in North America and that, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people uh, cross here every day and that uh, relations between regions matter, uh, that it matters for, for, for water governance, sustainability, um, that the uh, relations between uh, Windsor and Detroit allow you to be part of something that's uh, that, that's uh, bigger than a mid-sized city, uh, then yeah, then it's a really intriguing place to, in, place to be. But as an international lawyer in particular, it's, it, it's, there's a weird kind of disconnect where state law happens in Ottawa, but practical diplomacy happens right outside my front door, and that's been really intriguing. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Francis Boorman, who's a researcher at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. And Francis says, uh, you talk about borders being in the mind. It strikes me that those psychological borders, often mixed up with identities like class, race, or nationality, as you say, are, are sometimes more important than jurisdictional ones. How do we find a place in legal studies for more ephemeral borders? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Thanks for that question. Yeah, I, I, 
I think you're absolutely right that there are these uh, psychological borders and some of them are, you know, ident identity based and you listed some of the social markers along which they, they might be identity based. Some of them are, um, you know, more um, fantastical or ephemeral and, 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 and Carl referred to some of those as well. And, and again, there's this, you know, and, and you get, it, it, and, and there's a very real hard uh, border. Um, but I'm just going to, this is actually not at all a stunt, <laughs> but I have, so I have my Canadian passport here <laughs> on, on my desk for, for Zoom travel, I suppose. And I was going to say, uh, and of course I've now misplaced it, but I was going to show you my, oh, I hear it. But here's in some ways what is more of a, a passport to regional citizenship. And that's a Nexus card. It actually matters to me more to have my Nexus card, which allows me to fast track into the, into the States, than it matters to me to have a, have a passport. And it's been a, you know, a psychological shift in my mind over the 15 years I, I've, I've lived, in, lived in Windsor. So there's definitely a psychological aspect to that. I, you know, I think like many people who, who, you know, who, do, who, who look at issues of you know, design in its broadest sense, um, struggle to bring that into the legal, right? And Professor Helmut, I, I wonder if it's Professor Oust, Mr. Oust or Helmut asked the question before about what legal frameworks exist. And there's always a, you know, a, a, a requirement and a temptation both to bring it back into, into the legal. But I sometimes struggle to reconcile how you, how you incorporate those things. And one of the things that I've, I've loved to see in the publications of, the, of IELTS is the term to visual law. Um, and and how it, how do we physically conceptualize law? And I you know I I, I in my PowerPoint presentation gave you some of the cliches of the border, right? The the inevitable pictures of a of, of bridge with its with its sort of you know metaphor beating over the head, but uh, but maybe just the just the, the showing of a of a nexus card, which is a fast tracking pre clearance kind of card, as opposed to a passport, gives you a sense of the kind of regional identity, which, in, you know, inhabits the psychology of, of, of border residents. Great. Well, I think that's a really uh, a, a great place to, to end. It's, it's been a, f a really fascinating paper. It's raised all sorts of uh, interesting questions, and especially as um, the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies sits within the School of Advanced Study, which uh, is focused on study of the, the humanities. I mean, this fits very nicely into the broader um, interdis cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary study of uh, identities, borders, and uh, notions of belonging. So um, fantastic uh, and appropriate talk for us uh, today. So I, I want to thank Chris for joining us and for presenting uh, a really rich and textured paper. And I thank, want to thank also our audience for joining us for your participation you. and your questions. Our next seminar in the director's series will be on the 6th of December at 1600 GMT. And I hope you will join me then. But until then, it's goodbye from the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. Thanks very much, Chris, and goodbye. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, everyone.